Welcome to Off Hours, a conversation between John Edwards and Chris Manning. One of the recurring topics that we've discussed and sort of talked a little bit around, but not not really gone into any detail, we've talked about free sprung balances a little bit, as well as things like probillions and, and other methods of, of regulating time in modern watches. And I, I know I've had a few questions come up with people who've listened to previous episodes asking about it. I thought it might be a good time to talk a little bit about measuring time and how we go about measuring time in modern watches, as well as a little bit of history as to how mankind has uh, attempted to measure time in the past. I guess if we drop back to square one, uh, the whole purpose of measuring time, the whole reason we began measuring time was just a reflection of, of what's going on up overhead with the passage of the sun and, and the stars. If I remember correctly, you have seen the largest sundial in the world in some of your travels. You want to chat a little bit about that, just to lay some initial groundwork for why on earth we try to measure time at all? Anybody who pays attention to what's going on around them in the world, it's easy to see the differences in, in the length of days where the sun is setting and, and rising as the as the year changes. And, and of course, as it gets warmer and colder with the season. So it, it's natural that, that humans will have tried to, to keep track of that. And of course, it's important when you're becoming a, an agrarian society, you need to know when to plant your crops and when to, uh, when to take them out of the field. And I think the, the earliest attempts to measure time accurately were using uh, a gnomon, which is effectively a stick in the ground. Uh, it could be even something as simple as a tree, and you can mark off the divisions of time on, on the ground where the shadow of the gnomon lies, thanks to the sun. And, and eventually mankind creates a calibrated gnomon uh, attached to a sundial. I think I've read that the earliest ones were sort of Greek and and Roman. So the people have been using sundials for quite some time. And they, they still remain popular today. In the 18th century, the Mughal emperor, Muhammad Shah, I believe is how it's pronounced, he created uh, this massive collection of astronomical uh, measuring instruments in Jaipur in India. The The most impressive of them is the Samrat Yantra, and that's the uh, this this massive sundial uh, that you alluded to that I've seen. Uh, so when we were there in 2012, we had a chance to uh, to wander through Jaipur for a few days. Uh, it's a beautiful city. We spent the afternoon walking through this um, this incredible sort of park that was created with all these massive instruments for measuring things like the the motion of stars and and things like that. Uh, but this sundial is pretty impressive. I think it's about 27 meters tall. And it's large enough that you can watch the progress of the sun moving across the dial. So it moves around one millimeter per second. Over the course of a minute, you can watch the sun move by six centimeters, which is rather impressive. And, and again, you can actually sit there and watch the sun moving across the sundial. Something like that's incredibly accurate. Obviously, some of these smaller ones are not going to be nearly as accurate as that. And the larger they are, the more accurate a sundial is going to be. Yeah, one of my favorite sundials is nowhere near that large. And you'd certainly be hard-pressed to actually watch the the motion of the, the shadow, or in this case, it's actually the, the beam of light from the sun traversing across the dial. You'd have to stand there for quite some time. Uh, but the particular sundial I'm thinking about is the Dolphin Dial at uh, the base of the hill that the Royal Greenwich Museum sits atop. And uh, it's just this really beautifully carved and, and intricate statue of two dolphins sort of jumping or arched up out of a, a wave and where their tails come and almost meet uh, at the apex of their jump. There's a an area where the, the sun can beam down through onto a, a concave surface that the that line of light travels across over the course of the day. 
I'll let you know what time it is. But sundials are, are sort of a fascinating subject all their own, and certainly the most accurate representation of how much sunlight is left in the day, or how the, the time is passing according to, to the sun, which is ultimately what all of our uh, measurement, mechanically speaking, became to be derived from. And now we've gone on to measure things with far more accuracy with atomic clocks, and now we're moving on to phasars and quasars and things like that. Now, one of the tricky things about measuring time with the sun, though, is that depending on where you are on the Earth, the amount of sunlight that you get through the course of a day is going to vary. So your hours are, are going to shrink or expand, so to speak, which uh, Chris alluded to a couple episodes back with the, the Wadokai timepieces that were made by Masahiro Kikuno. But of course, one of the big problems with using a sundial to measure time is that you need the sun in the sky to be able to actually measure time. And uh, depending on where you are in the world, you may not get very much sunlight during the day. Uh, the farther north, of course, you go, the, the less sunlight you have during the day. And then uh, you also run into problems of uh, living in a, a country where it's overcast and you may not see the sun for many days. And so a, a sundial isn't necessarily the uh, the most convenient thing when it comes to measuring time. Yeah, I was quite fortunate that the, the dolphin dial was actually displaying the time of the day I was there. Because <laughs> when you're living in, in Greenwich or, or London, the forecast is, well, the weather report is always that it's it's either rained, raining, or about to rain. So the, <laughs> very rarely do you actually get to see the sun throughout the year there so london's not that bad john stop stop saying that it's that bad it's okay. london is not that bad well i'm sure you're you're enjoying yourself i certainly enjoyed my time in in london when i uh, got to frequent it on the weekends and i was very fortunate to get quite a few sunny breaks but it was often quite overcast and, and perhaps that's the reason that greenwich came to be the center of measuring time and why london and england in general became such a a strong force in the, the history of measuring time mechanically. If you're listening while this podcast is, is, has been published, then, then I'm currently in London, uh, but recording this the week ahead of time. So uh, I unfortunately I won't have time to go to Greenwich while I'm there this time, but when I'm back in August and September, I will uh, I will be making a trip out to, uh, to Greenwich, and then I will be sure to check out this sundial. But of course, you know, as we say, sundi sundials are only really useful when you've got sun, so... We've been trying to create ways of measuring time mechanically for quite a while. And the first significant attempts at measuring time with any degree of accuracy start coming in the, the 14th century. And we see uh, Virgin Follett clocks being created, first as tower clocks. So you've got a, a large tower clock in the center of a of a town, and then... Eventually, we uh, towards the the middle of the 14th century, we start seeing small chamber clocks being made with uh, with a virgin follet escapement. And while they are certainly an improvement because you don't need the sun to be shining, and you can tell the time after dark, and you can you can set up alarm clocks and things like that, uh, or you can have this large clock in the central square uh, that you can reference. Uh, they're they're still not particularly accurate. I've been looking at, at making a replica of a 14th century clock, and, a, and a, an acquaintance of mine uh, made one a number of years ago. I think he was keeping it accurate to within around 20 minutes a week, uh, which isn't particularly accurate when it comes to to a timepiece. And now, fortunately, towards the middle of the 17th century, Christian Huygen figures out the relationship of the length of a pendulum to a period of its swing and figures out that it can be used to accurately regulate a mechanical timepiece. And for several hundred years, the pendulum becomes the most accurate way to measure time and create a, an accurate timepiece. Uh, he also is the one who invents the hairspring. I wasn't aware that it had been invented so early on in timekeeping. Uh, 
Robert Hook might throw him a, a right hook on that one. Oh yeah, you think so? There's, there's some contestation there, but documented it, it is. It's Higgins. Yeah, so you're still you're still still talking the you know sort of 1675 somewhere around there. So that's quite early on in terms of uh, in terms of timekeeping, mechanical timekeeping, and regardless of who it is, it uh, it's still pretty early on. I guess we want to talk a little bit about what's going on in a, mecha- a modern mechanical watch. I mean, obviously these you know these older watches they're not they don't really relate to what we're doing today. Uh, been a number of significant changes in the way that we tell time since the the 17th century. Particularly, we're carrying these things around on our wrists instead of having a large clock in in a tower or or on a you know on a table even. So, I guess in a modern watch, what is actually regulating that watch so that it, it divides up the day into into an equal number of seconds? Well, uh, for obvious reasons, you, you can't use a, a pendulum because a pendulum depends on on gravity. In a perfect mathematical model, it would be gravity sustaining it. You didn't have any sort of friction or, or air resistance. That pendulum would just keep swinging back and forth. But in reality, you need some outside force to continue that motion of the pendulum. But it's ultimately the force of gravity that is, is causing the motion. But because a timepiece that is worn on the body is not kept in a fixed position, gravity isn't able to be that sustaining force. So what you have instead is a, a spring and both a, a spring driven mass and a pendulum are harmonic oscillators in theory without any sort of outside disturbances. Once set in motion, they would continue in that motion at a very precise interval of time that would be constant and would just continue on in that way. So in a a modern mechanical watch, which you essentially have acting as your your oscillator, which is what we'll refer to this as, is a a wheel, which is a, a balance wheel, and where the the mass is distributed largely around the perimeter of the wheel, and then you have a spring that is a hairspring, that if you were to pull this wheel and, and turn it and then let it go, the the wheel would push on the spring to a a certain point and then the spring would push back on the wheel and that cycle would just happen back and forth and back and forth and the hairspring is curled up in a form similar to say a snail's shell so arc in on itself and that would be a a modern hairspring not a very simple flat hairspring if somebody's looking at the back of uh, a watch let's say that has a uh, a crystal on it to see to see into the movement the balance and the hairspring you're talking about are the the little the little wheel that's that's vibrating back and forth and sort of the coiled spring that's underneath it. That, that's that's what you're talking about. That's correct. And it would be if you happen to have a skeletonized piece, it's the the spring that's moving very rapidly back and forth. It looks like almost like it's breathing. Uh, whereas if you have a right. a barrel that happens to be skeletonized, you would also see another coiled spring. But that's the the mainspring, the power source of the watch. It's important to mention that the hairspring that's there is really not the power source of the the watch. The power source is going to be that mainspring that's coiled up and providing sort of constant force to the whole mechanism. And, And the hairspring and balance are what are generating the regular period that that you're you're then dividing up. Yeah, the. The role of the hairspring is to push the balance wheel back from where it came from or to pull it back once it, it crosses that point of rest. So depending on which direction the balance wheel is moving in, the hairspring will either be contracting or expanding. So it will expand right. to its outermost point for the amount of energy that the balance wheel is vibrating with, and then it will contract in on the, its innermost point based on the amount of energy, and then it will restore that energy back and it just goes back and forth and back and forth for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction really it is acting like a pendulum it's just instead of it sweeping in an arc it's uh, spinning around that center point mm-hmm. and rather than gravity being helpful in in this case gravity actually right. tends to be an, an enemy of precision sure and that's where we start getting into complications like the tourbillon and the multi-axis tourbillons that we've mentioned in the past mm-hmm so we're taking this balance, which is vibrating back and forth, and the the hairspring that's assisting it. How is that motion 
being turned into something that can regulate the time in the timepiece. Because that mainspring, presumably, that's driving it, wants to just release and unwind completely as fast as possible. So how is that balance wheel, how is it being controlled and harnessed to to regulate the time in the watch? So this is where the escapement comes into play. So the escapement's an interesting mechanical device in that it is both acting as a means of transmission of energy to the oscillator, but it is also performing the division of time. So taking the regular motion of the oscillator and transferring that motion back into the gear train so that the gear train will be unwinding at a regular rate and allowing the device to display the time. So the, the, the tick-tock that you hear in, say, a mechanical clock or a mechanical watch that tick in a, a grandfather clock, say, that is the escapement moving back and forth. And on each tick and each tock, it's transferring some energy to the pendulum. Or in the case of a, a wristwatch, it's transferring the energy to the balance wheel. And if you really zero in on the, the tick tock sound, you can actually break it down even further and you actually get a, a sound that's caused by the, the pendulum or the balance wheel unlocking the escapement where it's first coming back into contact with it so that's the point at mm. which the measurement of time which the oscillator is responsible for so the pendulum and the the balance wheel are what are breaking time down into very small slices and then from there there'll be a, a follow-up sound that's usually louder where the escapement is then transferring the energy to the the pendulum or the balance wheel so the two work back and forth harmoniously okay so that transfer of energy back is is what's allowing us to operate in a in a non-idealized world where we actually have things like friction and air resistance and things like that that mm -hmm. are that are slowing down either the the balance or the the pendulum that's right now when we're talking about hairsprings one of the things that that you'll see when you're reading about the statistics of a particular watch is the frequency uh, that the watch is oscillating at or the, the frequency that that hairspring is vibrating at Talk a little bit about why there's differences in in those oscillations. Like, what, what's what's going on there? Uh, why is one oscillating at a different rate than another watch? Well, there are two different ways we could approach that. So there are the the physical reasons why that's actually occurring, or there are the ideological reasons why one watch will run at a faster pace than, say, another. As we've talked about in other episodes, everything is a trade off. So ideologically speaking, a faster rate will be less susceptible to outside interference, but have a shorter power reserve and be more likely to wear out quickly as far as the actual mechanics of the piece are concerned. A slower rate is more susceptible to outside disturbances. So if you say receive a hard knock in between a tick and a talk, it can throw things off, but you get a longer power reserve, and you also end up with a, a watch that's going to, to last longer than one that's running, say, twice as fast. So a fairly typical rate in years of old would have been 18,000 beats per hour. And ship's chronometers will be even slower than that. The happy middle ground that the industry seems to have settled on is about 28,800 beats per hour. But there are some watches where, you know, that will change. You end up with uh, 21,600 beats per hour, or say in the case of the Delonghi's annual calendar we were talking about in the last two episodes, that base caliber typically runs at 28,800 beats per hour, and you get a power reserve of about two days. But in the Delonghi's annual calendar, what they've done is dial it down so that it's running at 25,200 beats per hour, and that gives you a longer power reserve. Mm. Uh, they've also done some other things to increase that power reserve, but a big part of it is, is decreasing that rate from 28,800 beats per hour down to, to 25.2. So you get about 64 hours, if I'm remembering correctly, out of that new caliber from Longines. That's a convenient way of, of getting a little bit more power reserve without necessarily putting either a second mainspring or a larger mainspring in, because obviously in a wristwatch, you're, you are limited in the amount of space that you've got in there. Mm -hmm. Now, to the best of my knowledge, the, the Longines does have a slightly longer mainspring than you would typically find in the, mm. the base caliber, which is a, an ETA 2892. Now, as for the 
the physical reasons that this occurs. Basically, what you're looking at is a, a shorter hairspring will beat faster, and a longer hairspring will beat slower, and a heavier balance wheel will beat slower, and a lighter balance wheel will beat faster. And same goes for the diameter of the, the balance wheel. So if you think of a figure skater spinning around in circles, when their arms are in tight, they're going to spin very fast, and if their arms are, are out wide, they're going to be spinning slower. So that's why you'll you'll see them spinning faster and faster as they draw their arms in. Sure. So same thing's going to happen here with the balance. Mm -hmm. So earlier you, you mentioned gravity being a problem in watches where it's an advantage in, in a pendulum clock where you're you're taking advantage of the the gravity to uh, to drive the pendulum how is it how is gravity causing problems to the balance in the hairspring it's good that you mentioned both the balance and the hairspring because gravity affects them both and both in different ways and both impact the regularity at which the balance wheel is going to oscillate back and forth for the balance wheel itself uh, really it just comes down to the balance it's called a balance wheel for a reason so you want this wheel ideally to be perfectly balanced around its axis so there isn't a, a heavy spot on one side or the other now this is much easier said than done so a very finely regulated timepiece will have a, a balance wheel that is nearly perfectly poised that is to say if you were to put it down on a perfectly flat a perfectly smooth surface just resting on its pivots and, and puffs some air on it it would just come to a, a rolling stop just very gently whereas if there was any sort of heavy spot on it at all what you would find there'd be just a little bit of back and forth motion when it comes to a rest or if there's a really heavy spot you would actually see the balance wheel roll back on itself a number of times before coming to rest and would just sort of oscillate back and forth until coming to rest where with the heavy point being closest to the ground now with the hairspring what you get is depending on the position that the watch is in the hairspring is always going to be pulled down more towards gravity so it's working around the axis of the balance wheel and gravity is going to be pulling down on this very delicate spring now where this can really come to be a problem is when you just have a very simple flat hairspring if you watch the action of this hairspring you'll find it will jut out really far on one side when it's in expanding and it'll pull in really tight and be tighter on one side than the other again when it's contracting and what you have then is a, a hairspring that's not breathing concentrically around the the axis of motion so when the watch is in a position where it's expanding most on one side and that side happens to be facing down towards gravity it's going to pull even more on that side of the spring and exaggerate that effect and in turn impact the rate and same goes for vice versa when that area of the spring that's really trying to expand outwards when it's acting against gravity gravity's trying to pull it back that whole time and the amount of expansion that you're getting out of the, the hairspring isn't going to equal the amount of expansion that you're getting 180 degrees from that position so then you get a variation in how fast the balance wheel is moving back and forth between the two so ideally what you want is a hairspring that is expanding in and out concentrically around the center of rotation of the balance wheel and the gentleman who who first cracked this problem was of course Abraham Louis Breguet with the Breguet balance spring or Breguet hairspring where you actually take the outermost coil of that spring and you bend it up over the other coils of the spring with a very specific geometry of which there are, are numerous perfect mathematical representations of, of different ways to form this overcoil is what it's referred to as because it's going up and, and coiling over the rest of the coils and this allows the hairspring to breathe in and out so that it is essentially perfectly concentric around the, the axis of rotation. And this helps to eliminate any errors due to gravity acting on the, the hairspring. So you're, the way that it's acting on the hairspring is, is equal no matter what position that hairspring is in. Now, when you get to say that you're getting deviations in time and, and regulation, 
are you talking about it just being slower or faster through the day? Or are you talking about, let's say, the length of a second changes depending on on the position that it's in throughout the day? Like, are, are you getting, is this sort of averaging out over the whole day? Or are you talking about getting specific increases and decreases at, at different times or different positions? So it would be specific increases and decreases based on the position that the watch is in. So there are positions that we tend to wear our watches in most throughout the day, but not all of us is absolutely consistent in that. So ideally you want a watch that's going to perform the same in all positions. So it, w- it will literally change the length of a, a second as measured by the watch, say with the crown of the watch pointing down or the crown of the watch pointing up. Okay, so I, I guess the the ideal setup would be that you're, regardless of which position it's in, you're not going to be gaining or losing time regardless of uh, of that, that setup. That would be the ideal. Uh, but realistically, what you're looking at is having a hairspring work in such a way that no matter the position that it's in, there isn't going to be a variance between the positions. So I, I hmm. you might still be, okay. say, gaining. You might still be losing because there are, are numerous other factors and, and variables at play, but you want to minimize any errors that are introduced by the, the balance spring. So the overcoil is one way. And now with newer materials like silicon, we're looking at flat balance springs that can achieve the same effect just through the, the geometry of the spring itself by having thicker and thinner portions of the hairspring. Now, in the case of a pendulum, the length of that pendulum is what dictates the period of its motion. Creating a pendulum rod that's not affected by temperature so that it doesn't contract or expand as the temperature changes is a, is a significant part of, of building an accurate pendulum clock. Is there a similar problem with a balance? Because as the temperature is going to change, especially as you're wearing it, I imagine that that balance is going to change in diameter. Is that going to affect the performance and the accuracy of it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Thankfully, Charles Guillaume cracked this problem quite well by inventing alloys of metal that are essentially impervious to expansion and contraction or basically being affected by changes in temperature for the reasonable range that you can expect a a watch to be running in okay so he he invented invar and and alinvar which basically stand for invariable invariable and uh, for the alinvar it's uh, that elastic invariable so invariably well, the, the elasticity of the alloy is invariable and Niverox oh, is owned by the Swatch group and is essentially using a an alloy based on an Alenvar for all of its hairsprings and they supply the vast majority of the Swiss watch industry with hairsprings and then you've got Rolex which has their own unique flavor in, in Peregrum so that's for the the hairspring. Is something similar being like are they using these metals for the balance as well, or is there a different process for for taking care of the balance? So those specific alloys are referring to the balance spring, and then okay. for the the balance wheels, there are alloys as well that are basically resistant to thermal expansion within a reasonable range of temperature. And most balance wheels sure. today are made from a, a form of beryllium copper. But you also get balance wheels made of, of all sorts of other materials as well that remain relatively stable. But prior to the advent of these magical alloys that resist changes in their dimensions when subjected to changes in temperature, what they the way that they tackled this problem was with a split bimetallic balance wheels, which would have an inner core of the balance wheel made of steel, and then an outer layer around the rim of the balance wheel that was made of brass. And then these would be cut, uh, one on each side, a kitty corner to each one another of the arms of the balance wheel. And then you would have screws in the balance as well that could be adjusted in and out. So as the temperature changed, the rate at which the steel expanded or contracted versus the rate at which the brass expanded or contracted differed and caused the arms of the balance wheel to move in or out. And then you could perform very fine temperature adjustments by changing the how 
deeply engaged the screws on the very tips of those arms were. So just like the arms of a, a figure skater spinning around in circles, you could vary how that balance performed as the temperature changed. Then those balances were typically paired with hairsprings that were made of spring steel. So those were going to be more susceptible to temperature variance than uh, than modern ones? Uh, actually, they're comparable, so you could get a very good rate out of that sort of balance. So the reason that balance was invented was because prior to that, you would have a balance wheel that was monometallic, made of just a single material, and that would change its dimensions as temperature increased or decreased. And you could get errors on the order of minutes a day, simply because your, your balance wheel was a, a little bit bigger at so many degrees Celsius or, or Fahrenheit. Now, interestingly, uh, quartz timepieces are susceptible to changes in temperature as well. So if you heat up a quartz crystal, you're going to find that your, your quartz watch is going to run quite a bit faster left in, the say, the windshield of your car or out on a day at the beach than it will living in, say, uh, the Arctic. Now, when I take a look at, uh, let's say, one of my Eterna watch movements that I'm that I purchased for my new watches, those balances are single piece and they don't have any of the little oscillating weights that you would see in a, let's say, an old Hamilton pocket watch or something like that. With the older bimetallic wheels, you can use the weights to help adjust for changes and variances, right? In temperature, yeah. Right. So with uh, with something like this, there's no, you know, there isn't any way of, of doing that. There are no weights to be able to modify the the balance wheel itself. Is the expectation that there's that there's no reason to or is the expectation that um, that there's some other way of actually moderating the or adjusting the timing of it based on temperature changes? Mm -hmm. uh, as far as temperature goes in modern watchmaking, it is a solved problem in okay. large part due to the, the breakthroughs brought about by, by Charles Guillaume and the, the particular flavor of beryllium copper alloy that is used most commonly in watches today is known as glucider. Interestingly, Nivarok's hairsprings or Elinvar hairsprings are not impervious to magnetic interference. And one of the, the strange things that can happen when they're magnetized is that they can suddenly become susceptible to changes in temperature. Hmm. Of course, there are a number of other ways that watches are adversely affected by magnetism, uh, but that is one of the more esoteric ones for sure. So as a watchmaker, what are you doing to adjust the balance, uh, the rate of the balance so that it's it's keeping accurate time? Because presumably that's something that, that's important to do when you're either building a watch or, or maintaining a watch that you need to to ensure that that rate is is accurate, how do you go about ensuring that? Now, as as a watchmaker, uh, I could go down a quite the rabbit hole here, uh, but I won't go into things like dynamic poisoning or static poisoning or any of of that for the purposes of our discussion here today. Just talking generally, uh, essentially, you have two points of control. You can change the hairspring and how it's operating and functioning, or you can change the balance wheel and and how it's performing. So with the hairspring, what you would be looking at is changing how long it is. Now you can do this very physically by changing where it is actually fixed in place on the balance cock, which is what's holding this entire oscillating unit in place, or you can do it in a, a more dynamic fashion. And this is the way that the vast majority of mechanical timepieces are regulated today. And this is with a pin regulator. And what you're doing with a, a pin regulator is you're putting two very tiny rods of metal down around the hairspring, flanking it on either side, very close to where it is actually affixed to the, the balance cock. And without actually touching the hairspring, you, you can guide and direct these, these two pins backwards and forwards in an arc along the hairspring. And when the hairspring is set in motion, it's going to hit up against those pins, effectively changing the active length of the hairspring. So rather than affecting its force from the point at which is actually physically attached to the, the balance cock, the, the force that it is enacting on the balance wheel to restore motion in the opposite direction 
is going to be occurring where it's smashing in to one of those two pins. So on the outermost pin, what's going to happen is the, the hairspring is going to be expanding out when it hits that. And when it's expanding out, it's actually going to pull away from the point where it's actually physically affixed. And it's actually going to lengthen very slightly. And you're going to get a, a slightly slower rate of performance in that direction. And then when it spins back in the other direction, it's going to smash on the, the pin on the inside. And because this is an arced spring, that arc is going to contract a bit to the point where it's actually fixed on the, the balance cock. And you're actually going to end up with the active length of the hairspring being shortened. And that's going to produce a, a faster rate. Now, because this is happening in a balanced way on every single oscillation of the, the balance wheel, you can sort of get that to, to cancel one another out. But what you'll find is most regulators, when they're set up this way, you're going to be angling those two pins that come down around the balance to get as similar a rate out of each of those vibrations as possible. And this is certainly the, the quickest way to adjust the rate at which the balance wheel is going to be moving back and forth because you just have to move a, a little lever that changes where these two pins are positioned but it is not the most optimal way to change the rate of a watch because you you are susceptible to the errors that are being introduced by the pins and you are also going to find that the rate is going to vary much more significantly over the course of a day because the amount of energy that's coming from the mainspring is going to change which is going to change the amount of energy that's being transferred from the escapement to the balance wheel is going to change which is going to be the amount of energy that's the balance wheels affecting on that hairspring is going to change. So then those active lengths are going to vary over the course of the day. So you get much less stable timekeeping out of a system like this. And now are you going to also run into issues where those pins can move over time? Because while you're talking about the changes in the amount of force that's being applied to them due to the changes in mainspring length, I imagine that unless you fix those pins in place somehow, they are going to be susceptible to some kind of motion over, you know, let's say years between between services. I wouldn't say so much that it would happen over time as with impacts or shocks. So you can very quickly change the rate of a pin-regulated watch by giving it a hard enough impact. So you say drop it on a, a hardwood okay. floor or bang it into a, a door jam that could be enough to actually shift the position of those pins. And a very small shift it all, is all it takes to have an effect of seconds per day and then into tens of seconds and and all the way up into minutes. Uh, so it, it to me, it's, this isn't my, my favorite or preferred way for a watch to be regulated. The optimal way, in my opinion, is actually to affect change on the, the balance wheel itself. So again, going back to that, illustration okay. of the figure skater expanding their arms out or, or in, depending on whether they want to be going faster or slower. What you can do is eliminate those pins. So number one, you eliminate a number of, of points of error. You can end up with a, a much simpler system. And this is where we get into the free sprung balance wheels that we sort of kicked this show off on and that we've alluded to in a number of episodes. So a, a free sprung Balance wheel is one where the only point that is defining how long that spring is is where it's physically attached to the balance cock. So there are two ways you can create a free sprung balance. You can there are systems that exist where you can actually change that point of affixation. So you can loosen up some screws and actually move that hairspring in a little bit. And that is a very delicate procedure and not the optimal way, and certainly not a, a very quick way to go about things. It's, it's quite susceptible to error, both in over adjusting or under adjusting, and also into introducing abnormalities into the spring itself, because you have to clamp the spring down in place. But there are watchmakers who have had success with this particular technique over the years, but the, the pieces that they are making are, are certainly not mass produced. For the purposes of mass production, what you want to look at doing is affecting change at, at the level of the balance wheel. So you will typically have inertia screws or inertia nuts that change the moment of inertia of the balance wheel. And that's just a, an overly complex way of basically saying the same thing with the figure skater, where you will 
if you s turn screws so that the weight is moved towards the perimeter of the balance wheel or even outside beyond the perimeter of the balance wheel in the case where you're actually using screws you'll be turning screws out further from the balance that will cause the balance wheel to slow down and then if you do the opposite so turn weight away from the perimeter of the balance wheel towards its center or move screws in towards the center then it will speed up and with a system like this you are not nearly as susceptible to the fluctuations over the course of the day that you would be susceptible to with a pin regulated balance and that's why free sprung balance wheels are favored among pretty much any of the great watchmakers from Breguet and, and John Arnold down through to George Daniels, Roger Smith, Kerry Votilainen, and then of, of course the watch manufacturers that have, have earned the most praise and have sort of earned their spots at the, the top of the heap over the years, Rolex and Patek Philippe. And they both started rolling out free-sprung balance systems around the, the same time, in the middle of last century. And interestingly, both companies rolled out a combination uh, at the outset of a pin-regulated spring in conjunction with a balance wheel that has inertia nuts on it. And then, then over time, el eliminated the, the pin regulator altogether and stuck 100% with just the, the inertia the screws in the case of Rolex and an inertia nuts or Gyromax nuts in the case of Patek Philippe. And they are a remarkably stable timekeepers and, and really is the, the best way to go about regulating a mechanical timepiece. So it sounds like in the case of these free-sprung balance wheels, they're, they're not necessarily easier to produce in mass production, uh, but it sounds like they are a simpler system in the long term, uh, particularly when it comes to being able to adjust and regulate them later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are certainly fewer parts and fewer things that can go wrong with the system. The more parts you add, the more potential points of failure you have, or, or the more variables you introduce, the, the more potential bugs you, you may introduce in, into a, a system. So uh, a free-sprung balance wheel it really is a, a distillation of just that, as getting it as simple as you can. You know, make, a, make something as simple as possible, but no simpler. Now with Something like, uh, like let's say these Eterna movements that I've, um, I've been picking up for my watches, they are currently pin regulated. How difficult is it to to take something like that and convert it into a free sprung balance and and turn it into this this uh, you know to, and get the advantages out of out of it being free sprung instead of uh, pin regulated? It's entirely feasible. It's kind of a, a pastime of mine, I guess you could say, of converting watches into <laughs> to free sprung systems. I, there are certainly some challenges. Most of them center around the hairspring and getting the, the pinning points correct and, and getting the length of the hairspring paired well to the mass of the balance wheel. Because when you remove the, the pin regulating system, you end up with a, a hairspring that is too long for the balance that it is paired with. So you either need to right. reduce right. that length or add weight to the, the balance. Now, often you'll be adding weight in some form anyway in order to introduce uh, inertia nuts. I was going to say, the looking at the balance wheel on these movements, they are quite small and there's, there's really, there, aren't, there isn't a lot of meat to them. So trying to add those inertia nuts to them would be challenging. So I suspect you would need to increase the, the mass of the, the balance wheel mm -hmm. anyways. And adding the nuts presumably would, would add some more mass yeah. to it. Yeah, it's, potentially remake an, an entire balance wheel if needed. But to, sure. to quote uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, who uh, penned uh, Le Petit Prince, the perfection is achieved not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. So I would certainly encourage you yeah. to, to try and eliminate that, that pin regulator if you're game for it. Uh, but there's certainly no harm in leaving it in place for your, your first few rounds of, of watches. I expect that the first few I will be leaving very much as is uh, just because I have other challenges that I need to deal with, such as uh, making cases that I'm happy with and whatnot. And I'm trying to avoid doing too much fiddling with the movement and trying to reduce the amount of work that's involved with the with the movement side of things. But I can see eventually 
wanting to do something like this, if if only to, to be able to distinguish the Eterna movements I'm using in my watches from the dozens of other brands that are going to be using uh, the same movements in their watches as well. Certainly anything that I can do to be able to distinguish mine and, and perhaps make them better timekeepers than... Uh, than others that would uh, that would be a huge benefit mm-hmm. i mean it's certainly achievable to create a, a chronometer grade watch with a, a pin regulated balance so you just mm-hmm. have to go down that other rabbit hole of, of static and dynamic poising um, right but you you absolutely could pull it off and there's a lot of other variables within the watch uh, that you want to make sure are, are just right and getting a good consistent delivery of power from the mainspring through to the balance wheel but i mean john harrison pulled it off when he cracked the the longitude problem i mean the h4 has a a pin regulated balance in it and mm. uh you know he he allowed britain to, to conquer the oceans thanks for listening to off hours you can find detailed show notes at offhours.show if you'd like to keep up to date with the show follow us on twitter at off hours john can be found on twitter at under the loop and Chris can be found on Twitter and Instagram at silver underscore hand.